In this video, I outline a specific lens with which to view motor development and learning through a complex systems perspective in order to spark a dialogue for its application in movement education. In a research review article, authors Karen Adolf and John Franchek write, according to a developmental systems view, motor behaviors cannot be understood in isolation, divorced from the bodily, environmental, and social cultural context in which they occur. Movements are inextricably nested in a body environment system. The body and the environment develop in tandem. New or improved motor skills bring new parts of the environment into play and thereby provide new or enhanced opportunities for learning and doing. Caregiving practices facilitate and constrain motor development. As a consequence, differences in the way caregivers structure the environment and interact with their children affect the form of new skills, the ages when they first appear, and the shape of their developmental trajectory. This may remind you of the nature versus nurture debate that considers the differences in human development as a result of both genetic makeup and environment. However, current scientific thought and research is moving beyond this binary idea of nature versus nurture with the emerging field of epigenetics. Epigenetics shows how environmental influences and our life experiences lead to individual differences in appearance, physiology, cognition, and behavior. Epigenetics is defined as the study of heritable changes in gene function that do not involve changes in the actual DNA sequence, but rather leave a chemical signature on the genes that can be temporary or permanent. This means the idea that genes are set in stone has been disproven and that positive experiences, environmental toxins, or stressful life circumstances can determine how genes are turned on and off, and even whether a gene is ever expressed at all. As we'll discuss in a moment, the environment is a complex system with multiple interacting variables, including social experience, resources for survival, physical landscape, and toxicological exposures that occur prenatally, postnatally, and in adulthood. So coming back to nature versus nurture, instead of individuals as being simply shaped by their environments, epigenetics points to a systems approach in development. We evolve together with the environment as a co-creative process. This brings us to a dynamic systems perspective that is founded on the principle of interrelationship, that the organism is always engaged with the environment. A system is two or more components in our universe and how they relate to each other. A system is considered dynamic when its components affect or change each other over the course of time. Dynamic systems theory originally stems from physics, chemistry, and mathematics. Today, DST is popular across a multitude of fields, including the biological, cognitive, neurological, and social sciences, and physical and occupational therapy. In the 20th century, Largely through the research and contributions of Esther Thelen, DST found its application in developmental psychology. DST is the broader theory under which the embodied cognition approach falls. Embodied cognition has roots in motor behavior and emphasizes that cognition typically involves acting with a physical body on an environment in which that body is immersed. Esther Thelen envisioned cognition as embedded in, distributed across, and inseparable from the process of perception and action. A few central questions raised by dynamic systems theory are, how can developing systems create something from nothing? And how do we account for the emergence of new forms, like in the nature of the transition from one developmental stage to another? In a dynamic system, no specific factor is seen as the single cause for driving developmental change. Instead, development occurs through a process of self-organization, from the multiple components of a complex system without explicit instructions from organism or environment. We can see this kind of idea of self-organization in the starlings. No one bird is in charge yet the flock organizes as a whole. Each bird is aware of its neighbor's position and direction of motion and adjusts accordingly. A self-organized system has no leader, 
There is no head bird telling the entire flock which way to go, yet they move as a unit. Spontaneous pattern formation emerges from the interactions. The system organizes itself, but there is no self, no agent inside the system doing the organizing. Self-organization leads to the emergence of new forms or patterns that have properties its parts do not have on their own. Developmental stages like crawling and walking can be viewed as emergent phenomenon with multiple contributing variables. The emergent property states that the whole can be qualitatively different from the sum of its parts, yet be dependent upon that organization of its parts for its unique properties. Form is a product of process. Behavior is softly assembled from all of the interacting parts at the moment. Assembly is flexible and not prescribed by a program. Interaction between behavior and subsystems is nonlinear. A small change in one subsystem can lead to big changes in behavior. This is called a phase shift. Dynamic systems theory strays from the idea that movement programs are stored in the central nervous system and are hardwired and pre-programmed. Dynamic systems theory shows us that behavior, or movement, is not just in the brain. It's in the brain-body-task-environment interaction. In DST, Movement development is dependent upon the continuous interactions between the individual parts of the system. These interactions are influenced by constraints. Carl Newell created Newell's theory of constraints in 1986 that identifies individual, environment, and task constraints in human motor development. Constraints are those elements that limit, contain, or help shape the development of movement or parts of the system. Without constraints, every possibility, or what's referred to as degrees of freedom, would be available to the system. The individual constraint is everything inside a person's body, so that includes structure like body weight and height and anatomical degrees of freedom, and function elements like perception, expectation, motivation, attention, all of the characteristics that make a person unique. Environment constraints refers to everything that exists outside of the individual. For example, the temperature, time of day, physical space and location, or the surface of the floor and the ground. This also includes social relationships with peers, family members, co-workers, and professional attitudes and support, and physical barriers or accessibility. Task constraints encompass everything involved in the action itself, so verbal directions or cues, the movement goal or purpose, the equipment being used to achieve the task, and the choice of training modalities. Task is the doing something, the responding to, the acting in, the participating with, the being in the presence of. Task is the action. Now, the individual and environment constraints are each their own complex system. Our body-mind complex system includes psychosocial, cognitive, and sensory motor dimensions, to name a few. And the environmental dimensions include socioeconomic, cultural, and physical location and outdoor landscape. The ongoing continuous interactions between the self and the environment are co-creating the in-the-moment solution to the task. Newell outlined that constraints allow for coordinated behavior to emerge. Constraints act as vital limiters to movement and influence efficient, effective patterns of movement. DST shows us that the brain is but one component among the many cooperatively directing patterns of action. For the body to coordinate the potentially infinite combination of neural pathways, muscles, cells, hormones, along with body segments and joints, there must be external forces outside of the brain's control influencing behavior and restricting the degrees of freedom. This is a heterarchical learning model, where there is not one more important element than another within the system. The ideas of heterarchy were first introduced to me through biotensegrity. 
Biotensegrity is bringing a paradigm shift to how we understand and experience the body. Here are a few different definitions of biotensegrity. Stephen Levin, originator of the term biotensegrity, says, Consistent with an understanding of biological life as an evolutionary and developmental continuum of dynamic functional structure, biotensegrity posits tensegrity architecture as a fundamental of biology, biotensegrity. This applies from viruses to vertebrates. Biotensegrity is part of system science, complexity science, and systems biology. And then Graham Scar, biologist and osteopath, says, Biotensegrity is a structural design principle that describes a relationship between every part of an organism and the mechanical system that integrates them into a complete functional unit. It is also a conceptual model that is causing a paradigm shift in biomechanical thinking and changing the way that we think about the complexities of functional anatomy. When I think of Newell's model of constraints, individual and environment and task, I see biotensegrity as the complexity science that weaves together individual and environment in an ecological system. So again, we see in DST that learning takes place according to the constraints. Limitations imposed by the constraints prompt growth and developmental changes. This traditional view of set stages of development, a determined, continuous, steady state, machine-like model that increases in complexity over time is challenged by DST. Instead, dynamic system theory is based on variability and dynamic stability. Instead, movement behavior is seen as constantly reorganizing within a system of infinite complexity and variability in a nonlinear process of development. The outcomes of human development are similar because there are certain patterns and configurations that are likely based on similar motivations for tasks that help us achieve safety, nourishment, connection, and locomotion. Behavior or movement can be both stable and variable. There are multiple pathways to reaching the same goal. The developmental process is not stereotyped and hardwired, nor is it random. Behavior fluctuates, but within limits. DST asks us to recognize motor learning as the destabilization of one pattern, so a new pattern of stability may be found. Coming back to Esther Thelen, professor of psychology, researcher, and thought pioneer, the onset of independent, upright locomotion, learning to walk, can be viewed as a dramatic phase shift in motor development. One day, the infant cannot walk alone, and the next day, he or she toddles by herself. Traditional explanations attribute this milestone to maturational changes in an executive function, such as increasing cortical or cognitive control of movement. My colleagues and I have suggested that walking alone is not so much commanded as emergent. No walking schema per se need exist. The behavior is rather the stable compression of many variables in an organism with a particular neural, anatomical, and biomechanical configuration with certain motivations and goals and supported on a permissive substrate. The benefit of viewing walking as a multi-component emergent phenomenon is to open a window on how the skill is actually constructed during development. We are not pre-programmed, we develop.